I'm the Lovelace. Welcome back to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Wouldn't it be weird if one day I said that and there was just somebody else here? Just the way my mind goes. It's like, welcome back to True Crime with me, John Smith. Just in case any John Smiths are listening now, maybe we could organise some kind of exchange. Today I'm going to be covering a case that I've wanted to cover for a very long time, but I also wanted to try to get as much research done as possible. So before I start, I'm always going to say a big thank you to my Patreon followers. I'm appreciating the subs, can't quite believe that you do. Also, just a reminder to those of you who are supporting me on Patreon, don't if you can't afford it. It panics me sometimes, genuinely. I mean, it's amazing, but I don't want anyone ever to feel any kind of need to support me unless they are in a situation where they can afford to. But nonetheless, I am deeply appreciative. The case I'm going to cover today, there is a documentary on, and I would really recommend you watching it. And I'll put a link so that you can kind of look at that documentary because I watched this when it first came out and then when I started doing the True Crime channel I thought at some point I'm going to cover it but I needed to find out as much as I could that wasn't simply taken from the documentary if that makes sense although understandably the victim's story is the most important and real life account that there can be. This is on a woman called Alison Botha. So she went through a heinous attack that I'm going to outline. But before I do, because this is going to concentrate a lot more on her story because it's a first account of it, she tells it, I also want to just bring in who her attackers were because, man, there is not a lot of stuff out there about the histories of her attackers. Nonetheless, I have done my best. So there were two attackers in this case and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about them before we get into the main area of what actually happened to Alison and her unbelievably inspiring recovery. I'm going to say that right from the get-go. This is a story of hope and resilience but it begins with sinister evil behaviour that very few of us could even imagine surviving. The perpetrators were Franz de Troyes and Tiens Kruger. I hope I've got the pronunciations right. So I'm just going to refer to them as Franz and Tiens, purely because Alison refers to them that way in her documentary. So it will make sense if you watch it after this, that it's in line with her description. So Franz de Troyes, who was he? Well, he came from a reasonably good family. His father was a police officer, would you believe it? He was known at school to be quite a lazy student, so the people that he was surrounded by said that he wasn't somebody who made a lot of effort. He was brought up in a deeply religious family, they were Christian. He did not feel that he connected with the Christian faith. We'll talk about what he believed in in a minute. He actually set fire to his school dormitory at 13. I know, straight away you're like, hmm, 13, setting fire to things. What scale does that remind me of? And you'd be right, it is a big red flag as far as psychopathy goes. Not saying that I can say he is one, just saying, bit of an indicator of red flag. He gets expelled, unsurprisingly. And one of the reasons that he blames his behaviour, such as setting fire to things, not doing well at school, is that he is influenced by heavy metal music. I know, like, even I at this point, I'm like, really? Were you playing the records backwards? What were you doing? Like, who gets influenced by heavy metal music? And don't pretend a lot of people do, because boys in particular very rarely listen deeply to lyrics and imagine what's going on in them. But anyway, he says at this age, he's deeply influenced by heavy metal music and he feels that it, like, turns him towards a darker side. I appreciate that that's his experience. I'm just saying... I've listened to a lot of heavy metal music, a lot of you have, and I don't think any of us are setting fire to our schools. Unless some of you have, in which case, comment below. Whether his family were embarrassed or whether they genuinely needed to move, it ended up that after the fire, they moved 93 miles away. Understandably, it would be really awkward for Franz's father, being that he was a police officer. That is not going to ingrace yourself to the local constabulary when your son is just randomly setting fire to schools. At this point, when he's still a young teenager, he meets a girl and she basically says that she's a witch. 
which is also something I find really useful on dating profiles, you know, if you're looking, just like, what's my speciality? I'm a witch. Like, the only reason I would believe that somebody was a witch is if literally they could do a trick, like I say, create a cake now, and they just go, boom, and the cake's there. Unless you can do that, I don't believe you. I'm just saying, maybe I have high standards, but just saying you're a witch is not enough. But nonetheless, they get sexually involved. They're both very young, so we know that he's having sex early, and that he has some kind of interest in, shall we say, the darker side of life. Please, before somebody screams at me that there are white witches, I know there are, I know there are good witches, I know there are bad witches, I'm just saying that she was one of the bad witches. I feel like I'm talking about the Wizard of Oz right now. I really do. You catch my drift, right? So basically, he's having sex with a girl who says that she's a witch and she's into dark practices. And apparently, still as teenagers, they start doing these incantations where she incites demons and he apparently becomes possessed. At this point, when he's about 13, 14, he decides that he's a Satanist. So this is disturbing behaviour for somebody with this age, right? Arguably as well, it can be that when you feel quite isolated and you don't feel like you connect, that you'll find things to cling on to. So it is possible that young people get involved with things that they shouldn't get involved with just to be cool or to feel like they have connections. Admit it, how many of us did Ouija boards? I did a lot of Ouija boards. If it is possible to be possessed by the devil or demons, I think I probably should have because we did a lot of them. Did you? Let me know. <laughs> Also, it's at this point when he starts having sex that he really recognises that he's having these kind of dark fantasies. When he's having sex, he thinks about what it would be like to rape women and he plays them out whilst having sex. So we also see this really disturbing behaviour. He's starting to have sexual relationships early, but the way that he's actually feeling turned on is to imagine what it would be like to have non-consensual sex. He's obviously engaged in, shall we say, things that are not positive for an adolescent of his age, and it doesn't feel like he has concerns about it. If anything, it's something that he kind of incites more and more. He's really average at school. In fact, his peers note that he's very lazy. When he's 14, he has to do the year twice. So he's not excelling. It's not that he isn't bright, it's that he's choosing not to do well. So his parents eventually send him into the army. And basically when he's there, he spends three months of his time in the detention barracks. So he has problems with authority. He's an individual who doesn't like being told what to do. After he's essentially let go of from the army. His parents then help him to get a job, and that's a job in a mine in Wellcom, which is in the Free State in South Africa. Now, at this point, he does manage to meet somebody. He meets a woman, he gets married, and he has a child. But then, pretty shortly after having the child, he leaves his wife because she didn't satisfy him sexually. That was his reason. Franz sounds like a delight, doesn't he? when he's not having sex with witches, he's blaming his wife for her inadequacy, when we all know that it will certainly be him with the problem. It's also worth noting that before the attack on Alison that we're going to cover, he had raped several women before, so he was quite happy to act alone. And I hate this category of rapist. And a lot of you will be like, what category? What is this category? There is this category of rapist known as the gentleman rapist. There is no such thing as a gentleman rapist, obviously. But what they mean by that is the fantasy that the rapist constructs with his victim is that she's enjoying it. So he will often talk to her, try to charm her in bizarre ways, ask whether she likes it, makes her say that she's enjoying things that clearly she would never like, and almost is using his wiles in his belief system to make what his behavior is acceptable. So that's the kind of rapist he is. He isn't the huge aggressive predator. He's much more a predator who then disguises in his own beliefs his behavior by acting like he cares about what he's doing. I think we can safely say by this point, he has fitted quite a lot of the psychopath scale qualities, can't we? Like I said, can't diagnose him, but I think we're all on the same page there. Now in 1995, he moves to Port Elizabeth. That's, again, because his parents have helped him out. They get him some employment, this time as a driver for a chain of stationery shops, and it's going really well until 
they find out that he's stealing from his employer. Yes, he's stealing money from his employer. Just a really great kind of employee, isn't he? Great kind of husband, just a great kind of human in general. Basically gets a suspended sentence of three years. And at this point, he thinks, okay, well, what will I do? I'll open a she-bean. I didn't know what one of those were either. Basically, it's a place where you sell alcohol illegally. That's where he meets Tien's Johan Kruger. That's in 1994. And he is the other perpetrator. He is the accomplice in this crime. So let's look at Tien's. Tien's is different when you look at his childhood because his childhood hadn't, according to him, been very happy. His father had left his mum shortly after she got pregnant and then his father actually went to prison himself. So potentially we have a bit of a genetic link there or at least a social conditioning link. His mum was married three times, which I understand would be quite difficult for any child and he did experience violence. He also suggested that he was sexually abused by his stepfather as a child. What I will say, is that his stepfather has vehemently denied this entirely and said that he will sue people who claim that that was the case. So it has been very, very much resisted on his stepfather's part. I will also let it be known that it was much later on that he claimed this and I think potentially there was reasoning behind it so that people understood his actions more. So make what you will of whether this individual really was abused or whether he used it as a ruse to try to get an easier sentence who knows, I'm just giving you the information. He also felt suicidal at times and he seriously contemplated suicide on at least one occasion. He had a lot of bullying at school. And the reason for that, which to you and I, this will seem ridiculous now, because honestly, I just don't think kids would react in the same way. I know kids are bullies still, but he had a third nipple. So they called him Dreetit, which is three tit. So. It really used to get to him that he had this third nipple and it meant he felt isolated and it meant that he felt quite rageful towards his peers. Tian's also really struggled to get sexual satisfaction with partners and because no one wanted to sleep with him, like literally that was the issue. He was frustrated because he couldn't find consenting partners. He was angry with women because they wouldn't have sex with him. There's a whole lot wrong with that idea. but. When you think about the rise in incels at the moment, for those of you who don't know what incels are, they are young men, particularly, who feel really angry that women won't sleep with them and they get really rageful and they really incite one another on because they feel that women should just be willingly parting their legs for them, essentially. That's their philosophy and they blame women not themselves. They're not like, maybe I need to go on a charm course. Maybe I need to think about the way that I ask questions at dinner in an appropriate manner. Maybe I need to think about some interesting dates to take them. You know, they don't think like that. They're like, it's the woman who isn't wanting to sleep with me. It's her fault. So he kind of had that similar age and felt really upset that he couldn't find partners. Now, similarly to Franz, it seems that Tien's believed in the devil too. Satan is very popular in this case. And his nicknames by people who knew him were Damien, as in from the movie The Omen, and Chucky, as in the murderous little weird doll from Child's Play. So he was obviously considered a really well-adjusted young man. One of the things that was noted by people who knew him was that he just had absolutely no feelings for anyone. Although, and I'll take a quote, he liked the aunt he had been living with because she gave him food and is friendly. A part of me wants to laugh because obviously that's the lowest bar ever. And a part of me wants to go, okay, so we can assume that Tien's had a difficult life, right? Because if that's your bar, well, she didn't hurt me and she did feed me occasionally. That is not a good place. So I'm going to say Tien's, unlike Franz, had a difficult life growing up. He also got involved in drugs and alcohol really early on. We know that that can affect the developing brain. Not giving him any excuses for what he did. I'm saying the contributing factors towards are more exampled in his upbringing than in Franz's upbringing. Like a lot of individuals who maybe don't feel that they've got direction, just like Franz, when he left school, he joined the army. And, bizarrely enough, also claimed to have an intense sexual relationship with a satanic witch. Maybe it's the same one. Maybe that's her witchery. She just finds strange men to bamboozle with a witchy wiles. Either way, both Franz and Tien's claim to have had 
sex with a satanic witch. Consensual, most probably, as well, which was unusual with Eremo. I have to say, whether that's true or otherwise, I don't know, but it's their story. It's also worth noting that Tianzi's mum said that her reflection on his childhood was that actually they were quite close and they did have fun. But she also acknowledges that she hardly had any contact with him as he got older. Which I find strange, because I can't go more than seven hours before wanting a GPS tag put on my child. Like, literally, is that not normal parenting? So the idea of not being in contact with my kid for like years just would not happen. Also, a psychiatrist who evaluated Tien's said that he suffered really badly from low self-image, he seemed incredibly easy to influence, and that the whole premise about Satanism was about wanting to belong. He wanted to belong. And Tien's also had this thing about wanting to have the power of being a demon. So he felt that being himself was not enough. There was something lacking about him. Maybe it was his sexual prowess. Maybe it was his conscience around the reality that he couldn't hold down good relationships. And maybe it was this desire to belong to something or someone. So the consequence of that is that Satanism influences him more than it should. And Franz, when he meets him, gives him that perfect opportunity to practice that sense of being more dominant. And I guess that if you felt weak and powerless and people are taking the mick out of you for having your third nipple, the idea of being able to destroy them as a demon potentially would satisfy you in your imagination, if nothing else. So you've got this perfect match, haven't you? Franz is the conscience-free manipulator and Chun's is the acceptance-seeking, impressionable misfit who no one really likes. Also noted when I did the research on the personalities, again, not a lot is out there, but it definitely appears that Franz was the one who needed to be dominant all the time. For example, when they were selecting victims, it was him who selected them. When it was the initial approach to the victim, it was Franz who went and did it. He was the one who gave the orders. That doesn't make Tians in any way, shape or form less guilty. I'm just saying that's how the relationship played out. Right, so now I've got you to understand a little bit about the psychology and the history of those two perpetrators. Let's tell you the story of Alison Botha, which I promise you will be worth listening to. So who was Alison Botha? She was born on September the 22nd, 1967 in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. Her parents were divorced when she was 10 years old and she spent most of her childhood living with her mother and brother. She was very, very close to her family. In her early years, she was a really good girl. She lived what would be considered a normal life, whatever one of those is, an average life. She served as a head girl at a school, so obviously she was bright. That was the Colliergate High School for Girls in Port Elizabeth. And when she finished her education, she actually went traveling for about three years. So she obviously had some real wonderlust. And there would have been a confidence there, wouldn't there? To be able to go and travel like that. So after she returned home, one of the things that her mum said was that she was really glad because she spent that entire three years just being worried about her, which she would. I completely understand that. She did go to secretarial school as well. So she had got herself educated, but she did feel that she didn't necessarily have a particular dream. Now, Alison found a job when she came back from traveling as an insurance broker. She really enjoyed it and she was great at it. When you listen to Alison talk about herself, she's like, she wasn't that outstanding, but the fact that she was head girl, the fact that she traveled the world, the fact that she did well when she got jobs, I think she probably has a bit of an issue with humility. Because to me, if you've been a head girl, it means that you are outstanding at your school. But if you listen to her describe herself, she'll tell you a different story. She's also incredibly beautiful, really beautiful. On December the 18th, 1994, Alison is returning back home after she's had a night out with her friends. She's just dropped one of her friends off and she gets back just about to get out of her car when the passenger door swings open and she doesn't even have a moment to do anything when she finds herself with a knife against her throat. And this guy is saying to her, move over or I'll kill you. Can you imagine how terrifying that would be? So in the blink of an eye, she goes from celebrating it's near Christmas with all of her friends to having a guy with a knife against her neck threatening to kill her. Now, even though he's put a knife to her throat and driven her away, he hasn't actually said he's gonna hurt her. In fact, he's saying, I just need to use your car for an hour. He introduces himself as Clinton. This was actually Franz, by the way. He tells her that he just wants to use a car for an hour and it'll be fine. 
He also starts asking her questions like, do you have a boyfriend? Which is hugely inappropriate. No one wants to answer that when you just kidnap me at knife point. And Alison says in her own words that when he was having that conversation, she kind of convinced herself that it'd be okay, that maybe this was a situation where she'd been carjacked, he'd use the car, he'd let her go. That was her hope. But then he stops the car and he picks up another person and that's teens. And she says the moment that she saw teens in the rear view mirror, she realized that she was in trouble. She said that he looked absolutely dead behind the eyes and that she knew in that moment that she was in danger, that something bad was gonna happen. I mean, I don't think she could have predicted what happened, but certainly it chilled her. They then drive a long way and she's being taken away from all residential areas and she realizes that she has no idea where she's going but it's a long way from home. They then pull over the car into basically an alcove. The alcove where they pulled was off-road and it was down a track and it was a really sandy area and it had like all barbecues there and things like that so there were literally no witnesses around at all. She was completely on her own and they actually ask her, are you going to put up a fight? Now think about that. These two guys armed in the middle of nowhere, no witnesses, no one to save you, and they're asking you, are you going to fight? Clearly you're going to be like, no, I'll be as compliant as hell, please leave me alone. Franz forces her to have oral sex and then he does the same to her and one of the things that she really struggles with in the documentary and when she talks about this in interviews is that she had an orgasm. Now for people listening you might be horrified by that but it's actually a protective mechanism. Also think about high anxiety and the way that plays with the cortisol and adrenaline levels and understand that this is something that rape victims really struggle with so it is not unusual. Can you imagine how awful that is? Can you imagine how terrible it is for anybody who is violated to orgasm? It feels like your body is completely betraying you, doesn't it? But it's not, it's a protective mechanism. It's why women should never feel ashamed of having that conversation. It's why Alison talks about it. Because in that moment, your body is in defense mode. It will do whatever it needs to survive. After she's been raped by Franz, he actually asks Tiens whether he wants to do the same whether he wants to have sex with her. And Tians makes it clear that he doesn't want to have sex with her, instead he wants to F her. And this is where that ridiculous psychology that Franz has comes in. He actually says that Tians shouldn't use language like that in front of a lady, that Alison is really classy. But for Alison, there's this clear recognition that Franz was bad enough, but Tians is another level. And when he starts having sex with her, he also starts to choke her. Some discussion takes place between the men as well. And that is that they think that they're gonna have to kill her. So she's hearing this. Can you imagine how terrifying that would be? So she's been raped, she's been kidnapped, she's in the middle of nowhere, and now the perpetrators are talking about murdering her. And the attack on Alison is horrific. She was stabbed multiple times. And Alison said that she actually remembered thinking at the time that Franz specifically wanted to mutilate her reproductive organs, that that was what he was aiming for. And actually they were really annoyed because they thought they killed her and then her leg twitched. So then Tien's took over. And that's when together they slit her throat 17 times. Just let that sink in. 17 times. Now that Franz and Tiens have carried out this utterly barbaric, in their belief, murder, they drive away, leave her naked. And as far as they're concerned, she's absolutely dead. After all, who could survive that kind of brutality? How Alison is alive at this point, I have no idea. And just think about that. Over 30 times in the abdomen, 17 times slashed across her throat. She's completely naked, completely vulnerable, and she's in the middle of nowhere. And one of the things that she says she becomes really aware of is her breathing. And the reason that she can hear her breathing so loudly is because they've severed her windpipe. And she talks about the fact that in that moment, she just thought, I'm gonna die. And she physically felt herself leave her body completely. Like she feels herself above her body. 
and she can actually see her body all slashed and all broken and she said that all she could hear was silence. So there's no connection with her physical form and she knows she's dying. But she talks about the fact that even though she feels this distance and even though she knows that she's left her body physically, she knows that she still has a choice and that she still can make a choice to return to her body, so she chooses to do so. And the reason that she gives for that is that she says that she realised, I wanted a chance to live my life better. I wanted to make my mark. And in that moment, she came back into her body. A lot of people who have near-death experiences talk about that moment, that choice, knowing that there is an option for them to return. That might not be easy, but it will be transformative. And the story that I'm telling you today is all about transformation. When she gets back into her body, she still doesn't know that she's going to live, shall we say, but she knows that she's got to do something. So she wants to make sure that her perpetrators are caught. Can you believe that she does this? So she has had all of those injuries. Just imagine what state she's in. And she writes in the sand, Franz and Tiens, because she's heard them talking. They drop their cover during the drive. She knows who they are. So as far as she was concerned in that moment, even if she was going to die, getting back in that body meant that the police would know who had killed her. And then heartbreakingly, she also wrote, I love mum. Or mum, I should say. We'd say mum in the UK. About this point, she talks about the realisation that something wet is around her legs and she puts her hands down and she realises that it's her intestines and her intestines have basically all come out because they've disemboweled her. So in spite of being in this agony, in spite of this horror that's going on, she reaches over for a denim shirt that she had with her because obviously they've left her clothes even though she was left naked, they hadn't taken the clothes with her. So she then gathers her intestines in, basically covering them. Now, I have no idea how she manages to get to her feet, but there is something going on in her that says that she has to try. And there is this horrific description, really, when she talks about the fact that when she starts to get up, everything goes black and she doesn't know why. And then she realises, and it's because her throat is cut so badly that her head is almost decapitated. So she has to push her head back on. This is true. I'm not making this up. Doctors will verify it. That's how serious that was. It was because the muscle in her neck had been cut. She had to reposition her head. Now, what is insane about this story and beautiful is that Alison was a long way from the main road, a long way. Think about her injuries. Think about the blood loss. She's holding her intestines together with her denim shirt. Her head is all but decapitated and the road is a long way away. And all she felt was something lifting her. Kid you not. No. Oh, get chills when I think about it. I did the first time I watched it. You've got to watch it now because you'll be like the same. And she just felt herself carried. She literally felt herself lifted and carried all the way to the road, and then she's laid on the road. Now, there's no way that somebody in her condition could have made it by herself. There's no way. And then you think about somebody finding her and carrying it. No way. As far as she's concerned, that was an angel. As far as she's concerned, that's what saved her. And also, then a car appears, and she's thinking to herself, oh my God, it could be her killers. But ironically, this car drives away. That drives me insane when I hear that bit because imagine being somebody finding a woman cut to pieces in the road, clearly naked, clearly in a horrendous state, and you just drive away. Fortunately, within moments, another car arrives and that car's being driven by 20 year old veterinary student, Tian Ellard. And what's incredible about this experience is it doesn't just change Alison's life, it changes Tian's life too. He and his friends in the car are absolutely stunned. Of course they are. They can see instantly this girl has been horrifically, horrifically abused. And he actually kneels down next to her, tells her that she's going to be all right. And one of his friends has got a mobile phone, which is amazing because it was literally 
at this point, really new technology. So the chance that not only would a car pull up, but that car in the middle of nowhere has got somebody with a mobile phone that hardly anybody had is unreal, a miracle. So they call for an ambulance and you know how long that ambulance takes? 50 minutes, 50 minutes. How she didn't die, no one knows. And if it isn't shocking enough that the ambulance took 50 minutes to arrive when you've got somebody who's literally clinging on for life, Eel had said that more worryingly, they drove really slowly to the hospital and he assumes that the ambulance drivers and paramedics thought there was no way that she was gonna live. They had never seen injuries on anyone like this who lived. And that's per se in the hospital. It's known historically as the case where she should not have lived. No one had ever come close to being that injured and surviving. And what's amazing is that Elad's life changed the moment that he actually met Alison because he decided to stop training to be a vet and instead he trained to be a doctor. And he grants that experience as the reason for it. When she arrives at hospital, no one can believe what she's like. They can't believe the brutality and extent of her injuries. Her specialist in intensive care said in his entire career, he had never treated anyone who had experienced horror like she had. In fact, when you watch him talk about it, he still cries because he's so affected by it. The horrific wound to her neck affected her trachea. They cut through her windpipe. Her throat was slit from ear to ear. That in itself is unbelievable to imagine surviving. Alison was also disemboweled. And remember what I said about where she had been raped? There was like barbecue debris, there was sand, there was dirt. And that meant that when they were looking at her bowel, which was obviously all disemboweled with her intestines, they were literally covered in charcoal, sand and dirt. And the doctors who operated on her to save her life that evening thought that there was absolutely no way that she'd ever be able to have children because she was so badly damaged. Now the intensive care doctor has a hell of a lot of work to do and there is also another surgeon on call. And it's unbelievable because in spite of the fact that Alison is clinging on for dear life, she needs more than ENT, which is ear, nose and throat, because obviously her throat is in just such a state. She's obviously got all these other injuries that requires a surgeon who can be an expert there. And it turns out that the surgeon who is on call, because he trained in India, he was actually trained in all surgery. So his specialism was ENT, but he was actually qualified as a general surgeon. And he knew that he could do it. He knew he could help her. And the truth is that when you think about what they had to do, they had to get every bit of her intestine and they had to do things like scrub it clean, literally with a scrubbing brush at times, because the infection that you can cause down there when dirt is left, remember the bowel is a really mucky area anyway, can be catastrophic and cause blood poisoning. It's why people die. So imagine at this moment in time, the series of events that have led you to Alison being in the theatre with a doctor who's qualified to deal with those horrific injuries. It's nothing short of miraculous, is it? Even more so is this. In spite of Alison being in that state, she was able to consent to her surgery. She was able to sign her name and she even wrote her mother's phone number down because she wanted her mum to be called. Like, it's unreal, isn't it? The ICU doctor said without that particular on-call surgeon, they wouldn't have been able to do it because he absolutely manifested the most unbelievable healing on that evening. And both doctors said that in spite of the fact that they are medics, in spite of the fact that they are surgeons, in spite of the fact that, you know, they are scientists, they cannot question anything other than a miracle occurred. They really believe that. That there is no other reason for her survival. That somehow, in spite of all her horrific injuries, when they looked at what had occurred, bear in mind how many times she was stabbed in the abdomen, bear in mind the throat, right? When they actually explored her injuries, none of her lungs, hearts were damaged, the bowel injury didn't result in any infection, and her trachea healed perfectly. Also, 
the hospital was so caring. And that ICU doctor, he stayed with her all night. He just wanted to make sure that she got through. Now, the following morning, the police obviously show up at the hospital and they take a book of pictures because they want to try to find out as soon as possible who these horrific attempted murderers and rapists are. And she's unreal because not only does she point out both of her rapists, she then writes the name down. So she's that strong. Think about this has been 24 hours of this horrific thing happening. The doctor is then told, look, as much as this is really powerful that she's written the names down and she's identified them, the chief prosecutor has said that the case would be stronger if she could actually say who her attackers were. So then the doctor has to go and say to Alison, look, the chief prosecutor has said that if you can speak their names, it will be far more powerful. I understand why, because obviously anybody can write names down, right? So that would give a defence an opportunity to say, well, it wasn't actually our client who did that. But as soon as the doctor says it, she writes down, take it out. Now, the doctor was really worried because they'd just fixed a trachea and he was deeply worried that it might affect the surgery, affect her healing, and she didn't care. She just wanted those perpetrators taken. She wanted them taken down. And when he took the tube out, she basically said, that feels wonderful. Again, just shocks you to imagine that how can somebody have that mindset hours after this horrific crime, that having that tube removed is wonderful. And then she said the names, Franz and Tiens. It was a really short amount of time that she was in ICU. Then she got discharged to awards and basically started her journey to recovery. And it's worth letting you know that her injuries were so severe, so devastating that a lot of her friends couldn't even face visiting her for a few days because they were so overwhelmed with what had happened. And then when they did go and visit her, they were absolutely blindsided. She had the most incredible resilience though. Her friends talk about the fact that she was joking and that they shouldn't cry because she hadn't cracked a nail. And she hadn't. In all of that horror, in all of that attack, Alison's perfect nails had stayed intact. But what kind of resilience have you got to crack a joke like that? I mean, I'm into gallows humour, guys, you know I am. You gotta, you gotta learn to laugh, haven't you? But I don't think I would be able to be quite as resilient in such a situation. And everybody who met Alison since that day has felt completely stunned by her story. And that was the beginning of her journey, really. She needed plastic surgery. She used to constantly have to have her abdomen scraped out for healing. And she said that when she looks at what they put her through, all her recovery felt was pain. That's the only way that she can describe it. She still has pain these days, but nothing compared to them. You know, she has manageable pain. Now, because of Alison's case, two other women's cases are also recognized. So two women had reported attacks themselves. They'd had their lives threatened by these men, but nonetheless, they came forward and that gave weight to Alison's case. So both the men are arrested and both are unbelievably shocked because of course, they think they've murdered Alison. They're not expecting her to be the star witness. And in fact, Detective Humpel, who was one of the prosecuting officers, said that when he told Franz that he had him and that Alison was alive, he just kind of went, well, there's nothing I can do. You've got me banged to rights, so to speak. It must have been so deeply satisfying. And in that moment, Franz actually took off a ring that belonged to Alison that was covered in Alison's blood. The arrogance of it unbelievable but I imagine that deep satisfaction of the detective where he's just like I have you and there is nothing that you can do about it I also have to say about that detective who sadly died in 2020 he died of a heart attack in 2020 but it was a career defining moment for him it really was and he knew that he wanted those men put away for life and everybody who worked the case said that that officer prepared for that trial like they had never seen anyone prepare. They wanted to make sure that neither of those men saw the light of day again. Because the prosecution wanted to have a really strong case, it meant that Alison had to have lots of tests, she had loads of indignified pictures taken, she had pubic hair removed, all of this while she still had open wounds. Just imagine having those tests and having to have the psychological steel to manage it. The investigators who were trying the case took it so personally. 
so personally. They absolutely wanted to nail it. In fact, Alison's case was the first case in South Africa ever to use a two-way mirror. So that's where the perpetrators are on one side and you can see them perfectly, but they can't see you. And Alison, this is like literally days really after she's got out of hospital, she actually goes and picks them out. So she's in this tiny little room and she said that that's one of the times that she felt total panic because suddenly she's face to face with her attackers. By the way, that is now the way that they've always carried on picking out those particular perpetrators using those two-way mirrors. But consequently, she had to deal with the reality of suddenly seeing the people who tried to murder her. And even though it took her a few moments, she just said six and 13, even though they look different. She said, even though they look different, six and 13. And she got them, absolutely got them. When the prosecutor who was trying the case looked at the information around Alison's experience, she said it was completely distressing because she had never dealt with somebody who'd lived. She said usually people who've gone through these kind of situations, they deceased. And suddenly there is this living, speaking woman who is actually taking her perpetrators to court. Whilst Franz was away in trial, he actually asked whether he could see a pastor because he said that he was full of demons and he wanted them exorcised, so to speak. Now, the pastor who went and saw him said that he was apparently possessed by incubus and succubus, but apparently successfully exorcised him. I would like video footage of that because all I'm gonna say is the exorcisms that I have seen on horror movies are very clearly demonic possession. And if I saw that, I would be convinced. But unless his head is spinning and there is green stuff being projectile vomited and he's speaking in Latin, then I'm not having it. I think probably he was hoping it would help in his case. Also, the investigating officer, Detective Humple, actually refused to handcuff either of them when they came up for trial because he basically said, I'm not gonna handcuff you because you can then run, and if you run, I can shoot you. Literally, that's what he wanted. He felt so angry, so incensed, that these men had carried out such a horrific attack that he just wanted to give them the option to let loose so he could kill them. When the sentencing occurred, the judge felt so strongly that he actually wrote down how he felt that they should never, ever be allowed out. It's quite unusual. Apparently, he's never done it before in his career, but he wanted to make it so clear and so documented that if somebody did let them out of prison and they did go on to reoffend, that he had done everything in his power to prevent that. I think that's really brave. Also, the death penalty had stopped being used in South Africa at this point, but he said, even though that would have been a huge decision for him to take, if it had still been constitutional, he would have put them to death. That's how he felt about these two men. Alison talks about the fact that she didn't actually find the court case traumatic. She felt more like she was just observing it. She found it difficult in the media, of course, seeing her story played out in the media was very challenging. On the trial, both Tiens and Franz pleaded guilty to eight charges that included kidnapping, rape, and attempted murder. And they were both found guilty and sentenced to life in prison on the 7th of August, 1995. Franz was actually given three life terms with no parole. Tiens was given a full life term plus 25 years with no parole. And even though you go, oh great, they'll never walk the streets. It doesn't always work that way because they do get opportunities still for parole. So Alison does have to live with fear that these guys could get out. After her attackers have been sent to prison, that's really where Alison's journey truly begins, you know, her healing. She has to move home with her mother. This is a woman who had traveled the world, who'd been fully independent, and she's suddenly living with a mother, albeit that her mum's amazing and deserves a medal. Of course she does, because she's an awesome mum. But she has to relearn everything. She even talks about what it was like having her first bath and like seeing herself for the first time in the mirror and seeing the injuries. And she talks about the fact that that really signified and symbolized a really deep depression. She stopped going to work. She avoided phone calls. She said that she started to overeat. It was all that kind of self-loathing. And she said that everything in her life that was bad, she'd just say, it's my attacker's fault. But then she realized the more that I do that, the more power I'm giving them. Like, she took herself back to that moment where she felt herself raised from her body, where she felt herself looking down saying, I wanna do better, I want a better life. And she realized that that's what she needed to do. She needed to make a choice. And 
at that moment in time when she's going through this deep depression and she's having this kind of epiphany, she suddenly gets this opportunity to go and speak at the Rotary Club to talk about her life-changing experience. And she said she was never more terrified than the idea of public speaking, but she thought, I've survived this, why not? And that event changed everything. Alison Botha has become an international survivor. She's traveled all over the world, giving speeches, helping others heal. She has the ABC, she calls it, attitude, belief, and choice. Basically, what she's saying is, you can't control what happens in your life, but you can control what you choose to do with it. And that in itself demonstrates, doesn't it, the willingness to reframe the worst things that can happen to you in your life and make it into something productive and positive and hopeful. I mean, she would not have chosen to go through that attack. Of course she wouldn't have, it was horrific. But what she took from it, what she did with it, it didn't just change her life. It changed so many other people's lives to the better. Like she has influenced so many. If you see her speak, she is inspiring. She also says that there's only been one other time where she fell into a depression and that's when she found out that her attackers might get parole. Don't worry, I checked. They didn't, they didn't get parole. But she said when they actually were looking at applying for it, all she felt were these memories returning that she would have to go through reliving it. Because that's what you have to do, don't you? When somebody's going to get parole, you have to give victim statements and impact statements and you have to relive it. And bizarrely, because obviously we know the internet exists, hence why I'm doing this, but bizarrely, Franz's fiance, her mother, so Franz has a fiance, by the way, at this point, yes, you, you heard me right, Franz, multiple rapist, slasher, psychopath. Yeah, he's managed to bag himself a fiance that's so enamored with Franz, because you would, I mean, if I was looking for a son-in-law, I'd definitely want a raper ripper for a son-in-law. But so enamored is the family that this mother writes to Alison and is like, oh, please help release him. I kid you not, that actually happened. Please help him, please release him. Alison, don't be a bitch release the person who would have murdered you. That actually legitimately happened. And so Alison understandably then lets the authorities know what the hell is happening. No one should have any contact with me and this should not be happening. How is this woman aware of who I am, where I am, etc.? How are they having contact in prison and so on and so forth? And she actually wrote to the authorities and said, whatever you do, keep this communication between me and you confidential. So that's exactly what they did. No, they didn't. They gave him a copy. They gave Franz a copy of Alison's response. And you know what he did? He was like, oh, I should feel really ashamed of that, shouldn't I? No, that's not what he did. He said, actually, what I want is a profit share of all of your speaking engagements, because at the end of the day, if I hadn't done what I did to you, you wouldn't have created this life for you. I think when we go through the psychopathy checklist, we can just add narcissism to it, can't we? There we go, complete narcissism. I nearly murdered you, but because you've made a life for yourself having healed and been hugely resilient, the opposite of what I am, I now require you to share your profits with me. You will be surprised to realize that that didn't happen, apparently. That wasn't legally sound. The final thing that I want to talk about before I finish this, what I hope to have been an inspiring, hopeful story for a change, is that Alison, in spite of those horrific injuries to her womb, in spite of them trying to steal her opportunity to have children, they failed because Alison managed to have two children. And guess what? The next bit that I tell you, if you don't cry, you will realize that you have no soul, by the way. So I'm just gonna let you know that. Her second child's birth was assisted by the man who saved her life, that 20 year old vet student whose life changed as equally as hers the night that he found her on that road. Makes me want to cry every time I think about that makes me want to cry but can you imagine the fact that he was there for her second child's birth? So in 2015 by the way they did become eligible for parole as I said but they had it refused. 
As a side note, I also think it's important to recognise that Franz's father killed himself two years after they were sentenced. So clearly his father had a huge conscience about what his son did. And it also is a stark reminder that perpetrators belong to families. And sometimes those families are complete innocent bystanders in the car crash of the child's life that unfolds. And in this case, it seems very fitting where Franz is concerned. I hope you've got something positive out of today's story. Like I said, I'm going to put the link in for the documentary because it is really inspiring. It's beautiful to watch. You will cry several times like I did. Even talking about it makes me want to cry. I hope there's something that you can take from today's story. It's that even in the bleakest of moments, there is always light. That even when the most tragic of experiences unfold and we feel like a complete victim, there is still an opportunity to decide that instead we are a survivor. And that isn't an easy journey. Christ, I completely know it isn't. I think that I'm definitely on a journey to trying to be some kind of survivor and it's definitely not linear and it's certainly not simple. But when you listen to stories like Alison's, it's just a nice gentle reminder that even when you think you wanna give up, there really is reason to keep going. And it's a thank you and a dedication to an incredible woman who is mind-blowingly powerful, incredibly strong, unbelievably humble. And I think for every single one of us watching this tonight, we will all agree that her story is one that we'll take with us for the rest of our lives. Certainly I will. Thank you for watching. I think it's been quite a long one. And like I said, please watch the documentary. It's absolutely beautiful. And if you've enjoyed listening, please give me a comment, give me a like. Even better, give me a subscribe and I'll see you again very, very soon. I did this without crying a lot. There is a few tears, but I had to stop and start again. Hence why my makeup doesn't look as good.